So how can I spread this savory impression of the Lord Jesus? Mark chapter 9 and verse 50 we read. This is Mark's version of the passage we read in Matthew. Jesus adds, have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. So one of the ways that I can give a demonstration of the savoriness of the Lord Jesus and can neutralize the bitterness in the world around me is by gracious dealings with my fellow believers. People see how we treat each other. And then in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6, let your speech be always with grace, that's undeserved kindness, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer each one. So not only gracious acts towards the people of God, but gracious speech towards the general population. We have been called on as agents of neutralizing bitterness in the world and spreading grace. Do you take that ministry seriously? That's what Jesus wants us to do. Now, Jesus warns about the danger regarding salt, that it could lose its savory influence. And what happens when it loses its savory influence? Men despise it. They trample it underfoot. You see, we set a high standard for ourselves when we say we're followers of Jesus. And when we start acting like the world, the world picks it up. I thought you were a Christian. I didn't think I'd hear you say that. They may do those things, but when I do them, I shock them. They don't expect it from me because I claim to be a follower of the one of whom we read grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Well, in the same way, the Lord warns about light, that we could, we could block out the light. And Paul takes this up and says, you know, we're doing the devil's work when we're not shining for the Lord. The devil tries to blind the minds of those who do not obey. But if we're blocking Christ, if we're actually putting a veil over Christ, and not, in, not letting the world see Christ in us, then we're in cahoots with the devil. It's really serious stuff. So, here's the Lord Jesus links these ideas of good works and good news. We have this double obligation to show by our lives that Jesus made a difference to us, and then to tell others how Jesus can make a difference to them. I remember a young believer that only trusted the Lord a short time, and he was scratching his head one day, and he said, you know, I don't quite understand why it's so tough, this uh, witnessing thing. He said, if we talk to God every day, and we talk to people every day, why can't we talk to God about people and talk to people about God? He just couldn't understand that. If we are gracious, and if we are helpful, and if we help neutralize the acid in people's souls, we will have opportunities to speak about the Lord Jesus. They will ask us what's with us. They'll ask us for the hope within us because they see the benefit. We will have a salutary benefit, uh, an encouraging benefit on the lives of people around us. 
Now, back in Matthew 5, we read, Let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship, his poem, his masterpiece. And we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God pre-planned, God designed before. God designed a strategic role for you to play in history. And he measured out good works that you could do in your ability, in your community, as a representative of the goodness of God. You were built for this, ladies and gentlemen. He goes on to say in Titus 2.7, by all things, we should be showing ourselves to be a pattern of good works. This is not random, haphazard, once in a while. This is a lifestyle. As we go out into the day, say, Lord, bring people to me that need your help. I want to be the agent of your grace to other people. Now, you're going to need the Holy Spirit to be in charge because people are going to yell at you, take advantage of you, they're going to do things to you, and you have the opportunity then of supernaturally responding in grace. And when you do, you win their hearts. You win them over. In Titus 3.14, Paul writes, Let our people also learn to maintain good works, that they be not unfruitful. There's an awful lot of unfruitful evangelism in North America. I think this is the reason. Because people don't know we care. They, they're not convinced that we care. They just think we're trying to get them to change holy clubs. When we show that we care about them, they're much more ready to listen to us when we talk to them about the Lord Jesus. And so here it is. This wonderful combination of good works and good news. I was telling someone the other day about a man in the city of Winnipeg, and he asked God to give him a strategic place, this place where he was planned before to do good works. He wanted to know what that place was. And he ended up being a custodian in some ramshackle apartments that were half under the ground, under some old building. And living in those shacks, those little, little apartments, there were the, the off-scouring of the earth, the, the flotsam and jetsam of life, uh, war amputees, people who had been abandoned, people who had struggled with uh, alcohol, and they were living in these little hovels. He said to his slumlord boss, I'd like to come in an hour early so that through the day I can take five minutes here or there and just help the people do things on my own time, if that's okay. Sure, as long as you get the work done. And so he would come into these places, and these, these people never got a visit. They didn't have any friends. Some of them were, were filthy. Some of them hadn't been looked after. And he would do little kindnesses. On Saturday, he would go down to the flea market, and he'd pick up some little pictures. And he'd come and he'd say to, say to them, say, I've got a nice painting, a seascape painting that I picked up at the flea market on Saturday. It would look just perfect over your sofa. Could I bring it in this evening and we'll put it up? Or he'd bring them a few fresh flowers. Or he'd do something for them. And he would befriend these people. And he would help them and fix things around the place on his own time. And when he had found people's hearts open to him, he would say, I've got a friend that I'd like to meet, meet with you. Uh, you'd really enjoy him. And Jim Gilmore would come down with this little custodian, and they'd go room to room, and uh, the man would make a little cup of tea, and they'd have some cookies, and they would sit. And Mr. Gilmore, in his beautiful, soft Scottish brogue, would talk to these poor, desperate souls about the Lord. And one by one, those poor, broken down, abandoned people were transferred into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Works, good works, good news. It's the perfect combination. Being like salt and extracting the bitterness 
and bringing in the savory aroma of Christ. And then good news, shining like light in the darkness and winning people to the Lord Jesus.